On this week's episode, we talked to Patik Parikh, and we had a great conversation about his first leadership experience going from college to a manager at Amazon, leading tens of people. We talk about his experiences that caused him to start his own company, originally helping first-time leaders to become better leaders, but now fixing on helping leaders in general, because in his words, when do you stop being a first-time leader? We talk about you know, authenticity, we talk about limiting beliefs, and we even do a little bit of a coaching session where he coaches me around my podcast. I really enjoyed my conversation with, with Patik, um, and I think that you will too. So let's get into the episode, and I would love to hear what you thought about it. Welcome to the show. It's so good to have you on. Appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, so I came across you on LinkedIn. So really excited to, to talk a little bit about you. My first question for you is, what was your first leadership experience like? Ooh, that's a good one. So usually when people talk about their first leadership experience, it, it has some backstory of I was with the company for this long. I gained my experience. I worked my way up. Uh, let's see. For me, I was recruited right out of college. And my, my first manager role was with Amazon. I was an area manager at Amazon. My responsibilities were to basically oversee a section of the warehouse, a million square foot warehouse, mm. oversee a part of the operation, specifically inbound, and oversee a team of anywhere from 15 to 60 people when we get into holiday wow. season. And that was your first job? That was my first real job wow because prior to this and, and my my drastic uh before and after prior to this the only jobs that i held i worked at dunkin donuts okay as drive through yeah um and then i worked at cvs pharmacy also yeah. drive through and that was literally to pay for gas and food during college mm. um before i got into this role and and it's kind of funny. So I don't even remember applying, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> okay. um, and and now, now we're going to share about how I am as a student. So yeah. I did things backwards. I was that guy who very much had a lot of fun early on and then okay. had to work his butt off to yeah. correct all that. So for me, I, I did an extra year. I wasn't always business. I right. actually was pre-med. And after my first year of pre-med, my aunt visited and she just point blank asked me, hey, why do you want to do pre-med? And I was just like, oh, that's a good question. I don't have an answer. This isn't going to work out. <laughs> so then I, I switched to business. But even yeah. then, I, I had to do prerequisites to get into the business program and all this stuff. Mm. And even then, I, I basically graduated a year late, an extra year playing catch-up. So this whole time, I'm, I'm this guy who's like, okay, well, all of my friends have internships. All of these guys have co-ops. All of these guys are doing all these things. And then there's me who's like, okay, let me just go to a few career fairs. Um, mm. I'm, and I had to change campuses when I got into the business school. So I'm, I'm commuting. I'm, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. But in what world am I going to get a job when, when I don't have any of these credentials? And lo and behold, email from, uh, I forgot what it was called, but the, the campuses, like recruiting uh, liaison, saying, hey, you have an interview set up with so-and-so. And I was like, okay. Um, and I know from high school, there's another guy named Pratik Parikh, and we got right. mixed up all the time. Like for the <laughs> yearbook, he's a year younger than me. Yeah. For the yearbook, they called me to, to take all the pictures for the clubs he was in. So I was like, hey, I wonder if, I wonder if this happened now with, with <laughs> our careers. <laughs> yeah. um, so I was, I was like, okay, let me just go to the interview, see, it, see what it's all about. Mm. And I was like, all right, that was fun. I don't expect this to go anywhere. And the same day, I got, I got an email. Hey, so we want you for round two in Delaware. I'm like, oh, okay. Sounds fun. Cool. But, but essentially, all this is just me saying, I had no idea that I even applied for it. I had no idea that I put my resume in somehow. I had mm. no idea this was even happening, let alone felt that I had the credentials to even pursue something like this. Mm. Uh, and then what it actually was when I actually got into that role to now actually answer your question. So my experience in that first real management leadership role, it, it was like nothing I ever dealt with mm. because in a, in an educational environment, let's call it, 
you're very used to, hey, this is the curriculum. Mm. This is what we expect. Mm. This is what our grading rubric looks like. This is our syllabus for this uh, semester or next semester or for your, uh, let's call it two years in the business program. This is exactly what you need to do. Prerequisites, mm. 101, 201, up to 401 to complete this specific major and graduate. So like you have a very crystal clear roadmap. Mm. And then to go from that into what I would only describe as just a whirlwind of chaos <laughs> where you you let's let's you're not getting the training that you need. Mm. Sure you get the corporate training, the modules, mm. some some of the off-site conferences whatever. But I would very much describe it as it's black and white training. It is very textbook. Mm. And what you deal with in reality is always the gray area. Right. Yeah. So it's never applicable. It's never realistic. It's never actionable. So the lack of training, the lack of guidance, and it doesn't mean that your direct manager didn't want to help. It's just they themselves never got these things. Mm. So they're trying to survive in their own way. So you're just figuring it out on your own, sink or swim, and you've never, and, and throw in this other X factor, and you've never overseen other human beings who also mm. come with very unpredictable thoughts, behaviors, actions, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, so it was, it was very much a stark contrast of what I was used to because you can literally just consider the schooling environment as setting expectations, very crystal yeah. clear. This is what success looks like. This is how you play the game. This is how you can get better at playing the game. Mm. And then being thrown into that first time management role is very much, here you go. Oh, by the way, <laughs> your night shift. Oh, by the way, they're 14 hour shifts. Oh, yeah. by the way, by the way. Oh, and expectation on expectation on expectation mm. with no, no crystal clear guidance on how to mm. execute on those expectations. So those first three months, I would say were probably the hardest thing I ever experienced at, at that point in time in my life. Cause mm. I left this part out. Uh, I got the offer letter before even knowing where I was being placed. So I got it three months ahead of time for my actual start date. Mm. And they basically said, tell us three cities in the U S that are your preferences. Mm. And none of them on, on the uh, list that we can choose from were anywhere close to home. I'm, I'm from the East coast of the U S okay. I got placed on the West Coast of the U.S., wow. Jersey to California. So for me, w along with struggling in those three months, it was very much I'm on my own. Mm. I am adulting for the first time yeah. on my own. I had to find an apartment on my own, figure out a car situation on my own. Just all these things that you typically want some kind of support system to help you with. Mm. Um, I, of course, didn't have out there. So those three months were very... I don't want to say dark, but it was tough. It was very, very tough. And after, I think at the three-month mark, because I started in July, at the three-month mark, puts us in around October. And that's when, because I was inbound, October is when we start preparing for the holiday peak season. Inbound does all the intake mm. so that by November, December, outbound can do all the push. Mm. So three-month mark, we have our, our headcount increasing in inbound because Remember I said it's anywhere from 15 to 60. Yeah, 60, yeah. Um, and there came a very, I, I, I still vividly remember this. Our dock was starting to run out of freight. And it wasn't their fault. It, it just, if the truck's not there that's scheduled to be there, or if the previous shift used it up, you can't, you can't just magically make it appear. Mm. And in and, and that moment, we ran out, so receivers ran out, which meant the, the work that got received and sent into the stowers starting it starts to run out so my manager literally marched across the warehouse to find me hmm. doesn't have a conversation mind you just straight up just says this is your job fix it this is why i pay you and walked away and in that moment i remember feeling just so so out of place hmm. in the way useless i just didn't belong and that was that was the first time i contemplated should i quit like i was lucky enough to get this job Maybe, maybe this was it. This is, this is my run of it. Maybe I should now quit. Um, and I, I very distinctly remember, like, do I call my parents? Do I, do I, send, do I tell them I'm, I'm considering quitting? And, and 
I don't know, something in me just said, no, this isn't your story. This is not how you go out. Mm. So, I mean, because that, that would have involved calling them, telling them, hey, supporting me with college was all for nothing because mm. I quit the job that I got from it. I'm mm. moving all the way back and I have to either lose a bunch of money on the stuff that I bought because I don't know how to bring it back across <laughs> the U.S. Um, but I told myself, this is not how I go out. I'm, I will figure this out. Mm. I will turn this around. I will become a better version of my boss. And the first, the first week, I put my head down and I just grinded it out. And of course, that led nowhere because I was directionless, <laughs> right? You just you want to work hard. You want to. Yes. You think my work will speak for itself. If I work hard, I'll figure it out. Mm. But that's not the case. Mm. So then I got a little smart about it and I realized, okay, look, let me look at my environment. Clearly, there are people here that succeeded that came in the same way I came in. Mm. So that's when I started getting smart about this is stuff that bad managers do. This is stuff that great managers do. These, for both of them, these are their habits, their mentalities, their practices, their, their best um, standard work way of doing things. And taking that, I started to build my own frameworks and strategies. Mm. And I would say that literally was the turning point. And, and I know now I'm going beyond your question of what That's was okay. that experience, but yeah. like this, this was the turning point to go from I'm going to quit, uh, I am not capable, I don't know what I'm doing here, my boss telling me you need to figure this out, this is why I'm paying you in, in three months, to after applying those frameworks and strategies, becoming the top operating shift, mm -hmm. um, having the ability to step in for my boss. And it wasn't just one or two days stepping in. Like he was gone for a few weeks because he had mm -hmm. stuff going on. So mm -hmm. I literally stepped in for him for mm -hmm. multiple weeks running the operation. Mm -hmm. And then I, I should have not found out, but I found out there were senior managers that run the entire department that were fighting over me behind closed doors wow. to get me onto their department. Mm -hmm. And that same boss who came to me to yell was now saying to me, hey, see what it feels like to be an all-star <laughs> oh, night night and day difference yeah. my, mind yeah. you whatever thoughts i had when he said that mm. but like night and day difference from knowing knowing the right things to focus on so mm. delivering impact to who when where it matters in a way that it matters to them and mm. it's not even like it was anything complicated or fancy literally it was focusing on myself mm. focusing on my team and mm. then focusing on my manager how do I deliver impact to those three aspects or those three areas of my role? Mm. Um, and it, it served me for the rest of my career. It, mm. It's not that I had to learn something new or complicated every time I moved up. It was similar focus behaviors. on these things. Yeah, mm. it literally, it's mentalities and, mm. and behaviors of what it really is. But yeah, mm. that, that was my experience wow. for the first time going into a management role. And how did how long did that transition take from you know that three month point where it's kind of like a dire situation to all star status? How long did that take? Three months. Wow. Yeah, three months and three months. Um, I, it's I literally think literally like night and day. <laughs> yeah, it was drastic, but these these like I want I'll call it subtle. These subtle things made the biggest impact. And it. What were some I, of those I think things? I broke down. I oh yeah. So uh, even within yourself. It's, it's simple things like we, we hear the buzzword limiting beliefs, limiting thoughts. Mm. But what does that mean? How, how can I face it? So it, it was something as simple as instead of running away from it, how do I confront limiting mm. beliefs? Mm. So how can, I, how can I be scared and still move forward? Mm. Um, things like developing and growing the team, like mm. the, a core part of being a manager, right? Going going beyond just the title and the role. How can I build a connection with the person behind the title? Because that'll come back and feed into, can we deliver? Can I, mm. can I have the hard conversations? Can mm. I hold you accountable? Can mm. I give coaching and feedback and delegate and have one-on-ones? Mm. And then I think, I think a really crucial piece that not a lot of people are comfortable doing is because they feel like they're being manipulative, but with, with managing up, another very big, big corporate skill. buzzword big skill but no one tells you how to do it they just no. tell you, yeah you have to manage up if you want to if you want to do well you have to manage up yeah um and i think by nailing down what what should i do and it was as simple as learn my manager's preferences mm. so 
what are what are things that set them off like things meaning actions behavior scenarios mm. what are, what are those um elicits what type of emotion from them mm. and then just learn to avoid mm. certain things or do more of others mm. what words and phrases do they themselves use so anyone watching this as in operations you know a very common term is copy copy that and that was something i realized early on they love to say that and uh, they have their own word bank of phrases and stuff but i picked up on well when do they use that when do they say that and by simply saying it back to them in the appropriate situation it's it it forms this this resonance you mm. start resonating with them and mm. they start seeing you as and i'll i'll describe this as how you have inside jokes and phrases with your friends that mm. you build a connection over mm. same same concept mm. by using the same words the same phrases understanding what to do what not to do it truly helped me go from liability mm. to okay he's not he's not bad anymore and then going from not just being bad to okay i find it pleasant mm. dealing dealing with him mm. and then the next step from there will be well let's find what is their frog that i can swallow so what is the annoying tedious hard to do task that they have to do all the time just take it off the plate mm. if you know that you can find the resources websites links tools that they use to do it and you can confidently do it yourself just mm. take it over so mm. now i'm not just not annoying i'm pleasant i'm not a liability now mm. i'm turning into an asset mm. and it opens the door for them to delegate more to me and at the same time i got to see what are what are some of the things you're doing at your mm. level mm. and that that also boosted my own development but like that whole thing what i just described who teaches that like what what training or program or or like in real time at work shows you that they just mm. they don't mm -mm. but again it was such a rapid adjustment and change that i i shot to being top of mind for them mm. and that's that's what then completely changed the way they viewed me and i went from you know hey fix this is your 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 causing an issue to hey see what people say when you're an all-star like <laughs> yeah you can tell that rubbed me the wrong way but still, a little bit it, it, the, the perception drastically night and day hmm. yep hmm. and so how did you put together the framework so you mentioned that you know you started to put together frameworks and test things out where did those ideas and understanding come from because like i said this isn't stuff that people teach you i describe it as and okay, I guess I kind of have to explain how I am at times. Mm. I love watching people. Like right. I when when I was in California on my days off, I would go and visit my buddy who lived very close to Newport Beach. Mm. And we would we would go out just to hang out after my my week of work was done. And I would just sit on the benches and just watch people on the beach. Mm. And for me it wasn't it wasn't anything creepy, right? <laughs> it was more like <laughs> I just I loved understanding why do people do what they do? Mm. Why do why do people act the way they act? What mm. what makes you think that thing was okay or how did you know that was okay to do? Mm. So I use that similar mindset just becoming a very keen observer of the human condition. Mm. And I just apply that to the good and bad. So with the good managers it really was as easy as hey I really like that you do that. Mm. What was the thing that you consistently do? Okay, that's that's you treat people this way, you set up your routine this way. Let me start doing that. with the bad it was twofold one part is obviously that was really crappy i wish to never do that so i'm never going to do that with my team but the the other part of it is well look you got to where you are somehow mm. which means you have certain skill sets and and experiences that you're clearly applying let me learn to do that mm. learn the good ignore all the bad and mm. start putting that together into how can i carry myself mm. how can i whether it's hard skill or soft skill what are things i need to start doing for myself so that i can begin to move up the ladder turn mm. things around and and so on i think it makes such a massive difference being able to not just observe people but understand why they do what they do and why it works and why it doesn't work yeah. so i think that that's something that i think everybody can do in their scenario is just look around you and watch and observe and understand and i think that's something everybody can do you know it's not like you yeah. yeah i think that's something everybody can do and i think we we refer to it as awareness have mm. self awareness so that you can understand how do how do i act and behave and mm. how does that affect other people 
And I think that's a very basic understanding of self-awareness. But if you can start that process of, okay, I did this reflection and introspection. Mm. Hey, I did this thing and it led to this impact. Forget mm. the intention. It led to this impact. Mm. Then you can start looking at other people. Okay, what were they actually trying to do when they did that? Mm. Well, what, what did they do to try to make it happen? And what mm. was the end result? Mm. And it just it opens you up to, to look beyond, hey, that was stupid. Why would you do that? And you can, hey, walk me through what you were trying to do. Okay, mm. well, like, what was your goal when you were trying? Okay, I see. Let's, let's try it this way. And, mm. and you, you open yourself and them to, to more understanding. And what does emotional intelligence mean to you? For me, I, I buzzword. It's another. It's another corporate buzzword. Um, but when when people say emotional intelligence, to me, I genuinely believe it is not as complicated as we make it out to be. Hmm. There are all these experts, all these scholarly articles about studies and what it means and how you can break it down in technical terms, and we don't need that. Hmm. Emotional intelligence literally is just. Can I, can I see and understand that this is another human being or this is another person experiencing a human experience? Hmm. And if I can understand that, then I can, again, be more open to them, be hmm. more supportive of them. It hmm. doesn't mean I have to perfectly understand what they're going through because you hmm. can't, you're not them. Hmm. But it can definitely help me try to see it from their eyes, from their shoes, from their scenario. And and. Hmm carry myself in a way as their manager in a mm. way that truly supports them that's truly mm. there for them truly mm. sees them as the person and not the role or the title or the employee id mm. what are what are some of the things that you think people can do to help them to grow in that understanding because i agree with you it doesn't necessarily have to be super complicated but what are some things that people can actually do to grow in that understanding get the reps in okay <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it is scary it genuinely is scary because, and I don't care if you're introverted or extroverted, because mm. those things do not matter. Mm. They genuinely don't. Because even if you're extroverted and you have all this charisma, you might be turning off that person without even knowing it because they don't mm. like that style. And mm. vice versa, if you're introverted and shy, then you put the pressure on yourself and you don't know how to start. So I'm a very, very big pusher of engagement. I... Okay. I Genuinely, and I'll die on this hill, engagement is the lifeblood of a team. Mm. Whether it is you to the team reporting to you, you to your manager, or you to your peers, coworkers, and other folks at different levels. Engagement, at the very heart of it, I always define it as engagement is you building genuine and authentic relationships on trust. Mm. You don't need work to do that. Mm. Right, the the task, the project, the program you're working on, doesn't change your or affect your ability to build those relationships. So if you can actually be genuine and be yes. authentic, because they are they are two different things, right? Your your heart has to be in it, and you have to actually put the effort in, genuine, authentic. If you are genuine and authentic with your engagement, hmm. you will begin to connect with your people, hmm. or your manager, or your peers. And from connecting is how they start sharing and you share more of yourself and you, you tear down those walls and you start mm. seeing them as that person. And, and what I was saying before, where you understand this is a person having mm. human experiences mm. and, and from that engagement is how you continue to build and stack on the relationship. But mm. the more you learn about this person, the mm. more you begin to empathize the more you begin to see them as another human being, the more you see them as, I mean, for a lack of better word, it's like, I want to help you. I want to be there for you. I want to support mm. you. I don't want you mm. to have to deal with these things and also have to work at the same time and, mm. and me be just ignorant of it. it mm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just caring <laughs> at, the, at the root of it, but I, I genuinely believe engagement is the thing that bleeds into everything you do. Mm. In, in your role as, as leader, manager, employee, what have you. Mm. I think that's so true because I think that 
engagement makes or breaks it. So, you know, you can actually be having a terrible time between p two people, but if there's engagement, you have the chance of pulling that back. You have the chance yeah. of making it better because we're going to engage about it. We're going to work on it. We're going to have that conversation. But where things really die is where like, you're having a bad time between two people. No one engages in the conversation. And that just leads to separation. It leads to like some really, really bad things. But I think you're right. Engagement is the biggest part actually of connecting, of trust, of building something like a great team. Yep. And I think the, the word that I would use is friction. There's mm. friction there without any engagement. So, mm. and, and this, this, call it a pet peeve. People always talk about engagement as, hey, did they participate in the meeting? Hey, did, mm. they, did they speak up and raise their hand when, when you ask for input? Did they give you suggestions for improvements and did you implement them? And I hate that. I hate that definition of engagement because you're equating engagement to being extroverted. Mm. And, and what you're basically saying is if they don't do any of those things, then they're not engaged. Mm. So you're telling me because they're shy and don't want to speak up, you don't have a relationship built with them. Mm. That that doesn't that doesn't compute. Mm. So when when we look at just these, what I I consider hard to measure aspects of engagement, you're always going to feel like you're not doing it. So mm. in the scenario of two people having friction, what engagement does is is it makes you curious. Whether mm. it's simply hey I just want to get to know you, I want to learn about you. What are some hobbies? Oh, when did you start that hobby? How did you get into it? Or in the scenario of two people having friction, it, it still comes out to having context yes. and asking the right questions to get context. So yeah. why maybe I have a, view, a viewpoint, you have a viewpoint. Hmm. So I, we could sit here all day and argue about our sides and trying to convince the other person. Hmm. Or I can just pause and hmm. ask you, hey, so why do you feel so strongly about that? Like, where is that coming from? Hmm. To, to really get to the root of it. Oh, hmm. Okay. This is what you feel about it, but this is what you're saying. Let me talk more to this. Mm. And you ease the friction. You, mm. you reduce the, the conflict. Mm. You won't maybe mm. solve it, but like it, it makes the conversation a lot easier when, yeah. you, when you get that context. It sounds like what you mean by engagement is like connection. 100%. Mm. 100%. Mm. Mm. And that's think... what like, that, that raw definition I use is always a, a genuine and authentic relationship. Mm. That's it with, with trust. Because mm. mm. that's expressed in so many different ways. It's like you said, it's not about just talking in the meeting or not. It's like, what happens outside of the meeting? Are we actually connected? Are we fully engaged? So, exactly. so yeah, I really, I really like that. So you, you started um, your own company where you're helping first time leaders. How, how was the journey to that? How did you get to that place Ooh. after starting off in corporate? So yeah, very much a journey. Journey is the right word. So one thing, one thing that I noticed when I, when I became that first-time manager at Amazon, the mm. area manager, what I realized then, because after, after that three-month transformation, I got put on a new, not team, but a new area. Okay. And I went from 60 people to anywhere from 150 to 400 during, wow. during peak season. And what I realized in this role, what I, what I found was like what, what brought me to work, what was a passion, was genuinely seeing these people grow and develop and blossom. Mm. Like that, that was the fulfilling aspect to me. Mm. And what, what made it hard was the actual work. But yeah. the people, the people <laughs> is what I, what I truly loved. Yeah. And I think that always, it always stuck with me wherever I went. So as I continued to grow in my, my career, as I moved up, as I went to different startups, mm. uh, long, like 70 year old companies, even, even more recent companies, um, what I noticed is that at, at every point, you just got more and more pulled into the metrics and the numbers. Mm. And the relating to the people just got pulled further and further away from you. So even, even if I wanted to, and I'll, I'll talk about my, my last role that I held before starting this business. Mm. I, I would spend most of the day in meetings just because I, I was a general manager. So I had to, yeah. I had to, deal with my VP, the SVP, executive VPs, and sometimes president of all the North Americas. Mm. And it's just, you're stuck in meetings mm. and you don't get out of them. And when you get out of it, it's maybe five, 6 PM. And then you, then you want to go to talk to the warehouse. But at that point, they're already, one shift's already gone. 
mm. the other shift is like halfway through their shift and they're they're scrambling to get the orders to push them out the door because it's about that time where all the carriers come to pick it up so you just you don't get that chance to really mm. connect with the person and see how can i help you how can i make your mm. life easier how can i develop you and mm. that was, it was just always the case no matter how much what role you're in how much you moved up mm. so for me I would I would call it radicalizing moments. I, I've had a few radicalizing moments mm. throughout my career that mm. made me think more and more that this this isn't how it should be. There's no mm. way this is this is what it means to be a manager. There's no way this is good management. Mm. Mm. And and I'll, I'll fully I'll I'll be transparent that the the first time that I dealt with like true toxicity, I questioned everything about myself. More. What do you mean by that? So when I, when I say toxicity or toxic work environment, I think there are two types. Mm. There's the blatant toxic one yeah. where it's just, you know, the person, your manager is just coming in, they're yelling at you, they're blaming you. And you're, you're, you can easily say that person is a jerk. Yeah. I know it's not me. Yeah. The second type is more subtle. Mm. And I think this is what we see more of. Mm. And this is what like really just tears people down. It's not that the manager comes and yells at you. But they'll do things like say one thing with you and then do something different once they mm. step away. They'll mm. treat one person one way. Let's say they were part of their team originally and you recently joined their team. And they'll, they'll treat you a different way. Mm. They won't tell you how you're doing. Are you performing well or not? They'll mm. just wait till the thing happens and then say, mm. you're really bad at this. Mm. So it, it is this really subtle eating away at you. And you start questioning well, all the, like for me, all this mm. experience at Amazon, was I kidding myself? Mm. Did I not know what the hell I was doing? Like, I mm. had all these, I, I was early 20s and I, I moved up super fast. I was accomplishing all these things. I had X, Y, and Z, whatever, right? Things you tell yourself, hey, I, I am doing good. Mm. I am proud of myself. Mm. I am capable. Mm. And everything in that toxic environment just tears that down bit by bit mm. by bit. Mm. So you question yourself, is this for me? Am I meant for this? Was I just kidding myself the whole time? And even if you get out of it, it leaves this almost PTSD type of yeah. trauma. Because then yeah. when you get to the next environment, next boss, next manager, you're, you're very reserved and held back because you, you have this thought of, well, what if? I don't want to do this again. I don't want to create this again. What if I do this? What if, mm. right? And, and I would describe those as radicalizing moments. And basically what happened at the startup was that they, they being the company that did the joint venture, they, they booted everyone out from the startup. They acquired, oh. they acquired the operations team, but did a joint venture with the parent company. Mm -hmm. And then after a year of it, they started booting the, the startup folks out. Um, and I, I was kind of like the guinea pig of let's test how we do it. Um, so with me, and I, I've, I've talked about this in my content before, so it's not like mm. I'm sharing something um, new. But with me, they tested out, hey, let's just put them on a pip and see what happens. And mind you, and, and I'm sure, even if I were to ask you, like, what, what is a, a, a proper performance improvement plan? What does it really need to, to be successful mm. for a person? Well, you would want clearly quantifiable yeah, metrics, yeah. very tangible goals that you reach to show you're doing well or not, a very yeah. easy way to measure it, Right. And, and constant regular check ins. Hey, this is how you're doing so far with this one. And how I knew it was complete, utter BS, completely subjective. Majority of it was my boss saying, well, I'll gauge it based on what he says and she says. There was no mm -hmm. measurable. Hey, if you do this, then you're succeeding. If you do this, then you're not. Mm -hmm. And we never even regularly like, they took vacation in the middle of it to like Paris or something. So I was like, All wow. right, I, I can clearly see what's going on and I feel better mm -hmm. about myself that now I recognize it's not, it's not me. I'm not the problem. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not this completely lackluster person who just got lucky early on in the career. Mm. So in a way, it was, it was confirmation that, okay, you're not, you're mm. not completely bad. But that, again, that was very much a radicalizing moment where mm. this, this isn't how you treat people. This isn't what it means to be in leadership. This mm. shouldn't be what someone has to go through to continue moving up the ranks. Mm. Um, and then... Finally, the very last role was very much um, my latest, one of my latest posts talked about it, where it was very much just, hey, we don't care what's going on with you in your personal life. You need to be here on a Sunday, on Mother's Day. And if you're not, you're not committed to the team. 
So I was like, all right, peace. Because mm. that's not mm. the lifestyle I want. And that's not right. the that's not the foundation that I've set for myself. Because I'm going to stick to my foundations. So mm. all these radicalizing moments that finally, after the, that latest um, moment, made me say, I'm capable, but I'm not employable. Wow. Because... <laughs> I, I can never, I can't do this again. I can't dance for mm. someone else mm. knowing very well that this isn't how you treat people, mm. that you shouldn't have to deal with these politics and bureaucracy, mm. that if you're not focusing on the people, how can you blame X, Y, and Z? Mm. So that's when I was like, all right, I, I can either pivot out of operations and use my time and my experience for another company mm. or use my time and my experience to help people, which mm. was that passion that I realized I had way yeah. early on. So it yeah. kind of, it kind of all came together at the right time. Mm. And so what's the, what's kind of the goal of your, of your business? What's the big vision? Yep. Uh, so you had mentioned that I, with this, I was focusing on just first time managers and that's, that's recently kind of adjusted. Oh, really? Yes. So okay. Cool. Maybe, maybe it was because of, okay, now that I've worked with enough people, I kind of realized this. Yeah. Maybe it was, Hey, I, I Again, I, I myself overcame limiting beliefs. But mm. what the realization was that it doesn't matter what level you're at, everyone is dealing with these things that I talked about, those fundamental things. Yeah. So why close off the door to them? So my okay. focus, if, if I were to break it down as a most mission, objective, strategy, tactic, my, my mission truly is to help people managers. I, I want to okay. help them... Um, I guess objective. I want to help them close the gap from a lack of training and guidance. Yeah. Doesn't matter where they're at. They all face this. I think it's something like 50 to 60% of managers literally never got any training. And then whatever they figured out on their own is what they continue to yeah. use to, um, to continue yeah. forward as well as pass down to who reports to them. So my strategy is really coaching. I could have gone about it multiple ways. My way of doing it is I want to do coaching. I want to coach folks on calls, individual or now, now group. Um, mm. And the way I do it is truly, I, I share these frameworks and strategies. I do these calls with them and I, I'll provide them resources such mm. as modules that I recorded for the group calls, mm. LinkedIn community, and even messaging. If they're mm. having an issue at work, they can quickly message and we'll knock it out right there. But my goal really is to help close that gap from a lack mm. of training and guidance because mm. everyone deals with it. Either, mm. either good management wasn't modeled for them. Yeah. They, they started to believe, well, going into a sink or swim is just paying your dues. That's just how you get through it. Yeah. Or, which I, I think this is, it's, it's an extreme, but I know it's out there. They just don't care. Mm. They don't care um, of, of, about doing a good job, helping their team, helping the managers reporting to them do better, or if mm. they're the manager, helping their team. So mm. I want to close that gap mm. with, with these core fundamental strategies, frameworks, mm. whatever we want to call them, because mm. that will serve them for the rest of their leadership career. I think it's so interesting, the, the statistic that you gave um, about like almost 60% of people who go into leadership don't have training. And I think for me, that's always been something that I've kind of seen around me in terms of, so in terms of my history, like I've had amazing leaders from day one of my career and awesome. I've been so yeah like it's it's a blessing to have had that but when I look around me I'm seeing like okay well this person is actually a terrible leader <laughs> but they're in charge of so many people right and you get promoted because you're good technically you're good at sales you're good at delivering IC stuff right. but then it's a different skill set when you have to lead totally really, different skill set you can almost call it a different career yeah yeah and, and you're almost doing two careers at the same time because sometimes you still have to do the stuff that got you there. You still have to sell. You still have to deliver. Yes. But then you've got this whole other side where you have to lead people and you're in charge of their well-being. You're in charge of their, their health. Like That's really what you're doing. So it's like almost two careers at the same time. But yep. so many people are not taught. Like it's not even really their fault. They don't know what they don't know. You know? Exactly. You can't blame them for their limited awareness if that's all they've ever seen. Exactly. 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 And that's exactly why I have this podcast is to open up the opportunity for people to hear from this is what good leadership looks like. This is what's important to be a great leader. So this is and that's why I really liked when I first came across your content was that thing of 
I'm helping first time leaders because they just don't know. But now I understand that transition because there are things that first time leaders don't know that also 10 time leaders don't know. You know, it's, yeah. it's the same problems. So I, I, I like that really, transition. Really helped me get away from only speaking to first time managers. Mm. Let me ask you this. At what point do you stop being a first time manager? Oh, depends on how you de de define a first time manager. How would you define a first time manager? Mm. I think me personally, I would say this is the first time that I'm managing people. Mm -hmm. the, the, it has a starting point, right? And yeah. I think that, that one's very ex explicit. This, mm. I, I've now become manager. I oversee people. So I'm mm. a first time manager. Mm. But at what point do they stop? Is it when they get the next promotion? Is it when they get the next role? Is it when they cross one year, two years, three years? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wh where is that transition point? And that was also something that I looked at before saying, hey, let me actually help people managers. Yes. Because that, yeah. that can be more inclusive. Because mm. mm. so I think what I took from what you were doing before was that, you know, if you're at the start of managing people, this is for you. But I think it's like anybody who's not confident in managing people or wants to be better at managing people. Because I think for me, that's something we should always be working on, always right. be evolving in because it's not always going to be the same. It's different with every person that you manage. Sometimes it's different with the same person you've been managing for five years, but something changes for them. And then I have to be like, it's always evolving. It's always 100%. evolving. hundred percent. It's, it's never static mm. because people are not static. People no. themselves change. Mm. Mm. So I would love for us to do like either like a bit of a role play or okay. for you to talk through one of your frameworks so you can show people kind of like, how do you do what you do? Awesome. Um, okay. What would, uh, what would you say? Cause I'll, I'll, I'll even describe what you're doing here as you're, I mean, you're leading people through your podcast, right? Mm. So mm. let's use that, that, uh, okay. context. Okay. So if you are going through this, this process of bringing someone onto a podcast, walking them through hey, this is how it goes, this is how we set it up, and even conducting it, mm. what would you say um, is something you face as a challenge while doing that? Because you, you're dealing with people, right, as you're doing this. Mm. Do you want a, a real-life scenario, or do you want me yeah. to like, make it up? A real no, life legit, scenario. legit asking. Okay. So I think I talk to, and purposefully, I try and talk to very different types of people, very different, from like gender, from you know race, industry, whatever it is, because I want my listeners to get a very varied experience, right? But with that, something that's really important for me is that my guests feel super comfortable to have the conversation with me. And sometimes I might not necessarily know how to make this type of person or this personality type, whatever it is, feel comfortable. Right. So when, when and I kind of knew it was going to go in that direction, yeah. just because a lot of times when we are put into a position, we either have expectations put on us or mm. we put expectations on ourselves. Mm. And usually it's more of the latter than the former. Mm. And from that comes about all these limiting beliefs. Mm. So even from, from you saying, I don't know how to, mm. that is a type of limiting belief. Mm. So in this case, you were saying you're not, you're not sure how to make that as inclusive as you want. You're not sure how to I would say almost get them, get them engaging in a way that shows their perspective and their side of things. So we can even dive into that. Like what is it that when you think about that feeling, when you think about that thought, I cannot do X, Y, and Z. Mm. What is it? What is the actual scenario or situation? What would you nail it down to that elicits that thought or emotion? And and I think there's not been anything that's necessarily happened just yet where I've been like really unable to do it. I think some of it is just thinking about the future and saying like, okay, how do I, how do I grow and how do I make sure that when I get into the situation, I can have the right outcome, which is that someone feels really comfortable. They're really happy to be on the show and they can bring themselves to the show. So it's kind of like, I'm just wondering, you know, like, mm -hmm. How do I how do I get better at that? How do I make sure that I'm able and ready to do that to anybody? So it's it's really more on the executing side of things. Because mm. it I mean it even from what I was walked through as we did this, you, mm. you do have planning put in place. You mm. do have structure. So it's not that you don't know and you're not capable, 
Mm. So it sounds like a lot of it is coming from the actual executing side of things. Mm. So mm. if we've, we've narrowed down the thought and the feeling, the scenario, so we want to continue going deeper here. Mm. So what would you say within that scenario itself, what would you say is the actual trigger that brings up these thoughts and feelings? I think, I think sometimes it might even be, so on LinkedIn, right? There's a variety of different types of people on LinkedIn and different, yeah. different levels of followings and different things like that. And I think, do you know what it is probably as well? Is that on LinkedIn, right? I'm still quite like, I don't know if unproven is the right word, right? But like, I'm still like an average to small sized like account. Right, you have some of these people who are like fifty, sixty, seventy thousand, yeah. like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like wild, wild yeah. levels. And I think sometimes that can make you wonder when you're trying to reach out to some of those people as well. Like, what are they actually going to think of my like my two thousand five hundred? You know, like, am I going to be able to? And that's the other thing, actually, is mm -hmm. sometimes can I bring value to my guest as well as them bringing value to me? That's that's another thing I would say. Would it be fair to really label this as imposter syndrome? I think yes and no. Yes and no. Because like I enjoy doing podcasting. I get a lot of good feedback about like what happens and people enjoy mm -hmm. it. I think it's it's kind of like, okay, how far like what level am I really at? Right? Like you've got like MBA, you've got G League, you've got college, you've got all these things. Okay, like am I really gonna be able to be like an MBA level podcaster? Is that really like what I'm gonna be able to do? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is really, I, I, I tend to narrow down imposter syndrome to just a few very small range of things. Mm. It's either age, experience, title, certification, degree, or gender mm. that most people will feel if I don't have one of these things, mm. then I cannot do this thing. Mm. So for you, like, wh why do you feel that you can't? do it on a you can't execute this on an mba level i don't know if i can do you see what i mean it's not that i'm saying i definitely can't i'm just like i don't know how good am i actually do you see what i mean like how far can i actually go with what i'm doing so it's not i'm saying i definitely can't it's like okay how good actually am i like so with basketball right i can go try out for the miami heat you know what I mean? I can go try out for Great Britain, but right. it doesn't really work like that in this. In, and maybe that's what it is. I come from sports where like, it's quite, you know, definite, like, yes, you're good enough to be in the NBA. No, you're not. Like with this is very different, you know, because some of it is like your video might go viral and then everybody watches your podcast and then cool. But am I actually good at my craft? You know? Got it. So then what would you say for yourself is your definition of good? Like what, what is, what is it that you compare to mm. or who do you compare mm. yourself to? So I think that for me, what good looks like and different people have different elements of it. So what good looks like for me is that my guests have a great time. My listeners love what they hear and that they right. are impacted. Impact is a big one for me is that people are impacted by what they hear to become better leaders and to lead other people and themselves better. So that's, that's what I'm really kind of trying to get to. And I think that some of that is going to come down to how well can I ask questions? How well can I make people feel comfortable? How can I draw things out of people that they may not have necessarily talked about before? That makes sense. And I, with something like this, because I mean, even with what I'm doing, it's, there's not really like a black and a white measure of 99% no. versus 87%. No. <laughs> but even, even with that being the case, how, how have your past podcasts done? How, what, what kind of feedback have you gotten from listeners and guests on your previous podcast? So I think generally really, really good. Like humblingly good, if, I, if that makes sense. Like I hear I'm like, yeah. I'm so humbled by the fact that that's the, that's the impact. So good. So then, and let me, I guess, give an analogy. Whenever we go for jobs and interviews, we're always preparing our resume. Mm. And that resume is what we give to either the recruiter or the hiring mm. manager or who, whoever mm. is part of the multiple rounds. That resume is your hard, cold, tangible proof of what you have done. Mm. Your achievements, accomplishments, and even your capabilities based off of what future impact you can bring, the mm. thing they're looking for. Mm. 
So why don't we do the same thing with ourselves when it comes to mm. limiting beliefs? Mm. And this is why I was asking about, well, what have other people told you? Because mm. from what they've told you and from what you just shared, it sounds like you have hard, cold proof that you're, you're doing the things you want to do. Mm. And one way to confront the limiting beliefs is to look at that hard, cold proof. It's mm. data. It's mm. no longer based off of beliefs or thoughts. Mm. Mm. It's based Special. off of reality. Yeah. Mm. And you said to yourself, it's very humbling. Mm. And like even for myself, as I'm literally this week kicking off this group coaching program, yeah. I'm, I'm humbled from even what I'm going through and what, what yeah. people themselves are experiencing. But that is us gathering this hard, tangible proof of mm. I'm doing it. I'm doing mm. the thing. Mm. But let me flip it on you. Mm. Let's, say, let's say we don't have that proof, mm. right? And you're, you're just now kicking this off for the first time. What does your worst case scenario look like? I don't know, actually. I don't know. Worst case scenario. Because I think, I feel like with podcasting, right, you start it and if you do your own, like do your research and stuff, you know that actually for the first year, two, three years, like people are probably not going to listen, right? So yeah. I don't know, because that was probably my worst case scenario, is that I publish things and I get zero listens every time. Mm -hmm. That was probably my, like, you know, that's almost a bit of an expectation at the beginning. And that's probably the worst case scenario. Or it's so offensive that people complain and get you taken off there would be probably worst case scenario. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a very human thing to do, too. Mm. You, you think of, like, the realistic worst case scenario, and then you think of the most extreme yeah. worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. But... Let, let's look at the, the realistic worst case scenario where mm. you don't get the listeners at first. Mm. So that means you have zero listeners, mm. zero, let's even say zero guests, mm. right? As you're mm. kicking this off for the first time. Even if that happens, isn't that where you're at right now? Kicking it off for the first time, no listeners and no guests? Yeah. So what, what really mm. are you losing? Mm. You're living your worst case scenario already. I love that. So what is stopping you from taking action? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's, it's so, and so often people are scared of doing something different, even though they don't like what they're doing right now. Like you're at the place where it's not like you're doing anything anyway. So what's yeah. the harm in trying? I love that. Exactly. Like for I me, I'll that. use myself as an example. When I made that decision to get into coaching, mm. what I was doing prior to that was I was, I was trying to pivot right from that, that mm. past experience. Mm. Mm. And my worst case, worst case scenario would have been, this doesn't work out. Mm. I can't get clients. I'm not getting any traction. I have to go back to job hunting. That's what I'm doing now anyway. I'm doing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one way of, it, you're never going to solve for it, right? You're never going to oh. eliminate mm. the limiting belief, but you but confront it. Yeah. You, you do it scared, yeah. but you still do it. I'm a big fan of just do it. Just do it. Big yeah. fan. Wow. There are a lot of things that kind of, as we were talking, going through that little scenario, where things yeah. that, like, I'd not necessarily thought of, like, I'd not had the, I'd not had the conscious thought of, okay, how do I really feel like the thing about the bigger accounts and stuff like that? That wasn't something I was probably consciously aware of, but it's really interesting to actually think that through. So, yeah, thank you. Sometimes that was really it's, interesting. it's just that nudge, right? You need, you need yeah. the outside nudge to say, well, just earlier this week, I had this on a call where someone told me when my team gathers around me, I am overwhelmed because I, and I'll go to the step by step. I'm overwhelmed because I do not feel like I should be in this management role because who am right. I to step into this? Right. Because I am comparing myself to what a great manager should be mm. and I'm not there yet. Mm. So I asked them, well, you think they became that great manager overnight? Mm. Probably not. Mm. And if you were to go try to talk to that manager who makes the perfect choices, makes the perfect decisions, who's never wrong, how comfortable do you feel approaching them? Mm. I don't because they're infallible. I can't just approach them. I don't feel comfortable. So it was walking them through that breakdown. Yeah. And then, and then the, the last thing that they told me was I also I feel also overwhelmed because it's not that the hourly associates are watching me do the staffing board it's because i feel judgment from my direct reporting um process assistants we call them my team leads and my peers 
And I told them, all right, well, how's your relationship with those team leads? Mm. They're great. It, it goes beyond the role. Perfect. Awesome. When's the last time you asked them, hey, you're really good at this and I want to get better. Can you show me? Mm. I never thought to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little nudge. It's so important. It's so, so important to, to get that support and to have someone yep. kind of ask you different questions that you would have never thought of yourself. So, yeah, love it. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Glad it, glad it I got you thinking. Yeah, 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 it really did. It really did. So just, just as we close, what advice would you give to someone who is wanting to get better in their leadership? As a leader or manager or just in general? So here we talk about self-leadership and leadership of others. So you can pick whichever to, to talk about. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go with uh, leading others. Mm. So there is this constant battle and debate of manager versus leader. Mm -hmm. And we always try to pin one as bad and one as good. So my, my like, super crystal clear advice, management is processes plus systems. Leadership is mentality plus character. Your role is to put both together. Mm. You don't have to pick and choose. You, you mm. combine the two. I think if I you're good at the mentality and character part, it makes the other part a lot easier. Mm. They, they work with each other, right? Because mm. technically, you still have to do your job as a manager. Mm. So you need the right processes and systems in place mm. to know how do I make a decision? How do mm. I do X, Y, and Z? The, the mm. practical stuff. But you also lead people without people you're not leading anyone no. you can you can argue yourself but even if you don't focus on that then you're not leading anyone so you, you need the two you need mm. the management piece of it and you need the leadership piece of it because mm. that's really what's going to make you well-rounded in your role mm. i love that Patik, thank you so much for for being on the podcast and sharing your story and your journey yeah I've, i really enjoyed it so thank you so much oh, thanks for having me i love this it's awesome yeah, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And thank you guys for listening and see you on the next episode. Bye. Thank you for watching this episode of the Dunamis EQ Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, flick through our channel and there's loads more that you can watch. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you can hear first when new episodes drop. We'll catch you on the next episode.